Hey, everyone. I'm Jason Weiser. And I'm Carissa Weiser. And you may know us from our award-winning podcast, Myths and Legends, but now we've partnered with Cast Media to create a new podcast called Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, a series that tells the true stories of some of yesterday's most fascinating forgotten bad guys. For example, you'll follow the career of Sidney Gottlieb, not only learning that through Sidney and his CIA team, the U.S. literally sanctioned mind control experiments and torture. But the story will open a window allowing you to really feel what Cold War America was like. Each episode will feature a new villain and a new time period you may not have heard about, but really should. So if you like crime, evildoers, and the darker parts of history, join us on Cast Media's new podcast, Scoundrel, History's Forgotten Villains, every week, wherever you get your podcasts. Nearly 10 months into my investigation, I'm maybe more confused than ever. I lose a little more sleep each night now, trying to piece together all that I've heard. How does it all fit together? Does it all fit together? Is someone lying? Is someone simply mistaken on their times, or even the day they claim to have witnessed Rhonda? Why was Don Creamer suddenly advised not to speak with me? These are the questions I'm asking now. I put together a timeline of all the events and eyewitness accounts to try and see what logically fits and what doesn't. I'll get into that more later, but for now, I want to look at the eyewitness accounts we have to try and poke holes in them, if I can. To me, That's the only way we'll get down to the facts and the truth. There's a lot of information here to unpack and examine, so stick with me. From Imperative Entertainment, this is Foxman. Starting with Chuck and Denise Thompson, there is the timeline discrepancy, first of all. Chuck said it was no earlier than 11.30 that they witnessed Marky and Rhonda talking where her car was to be found abandoned. But we know this time can't be accurate because of the other statements and the police dispatch log. I spoke with Chuck again recently, and after he'd heard the other information provided, He did tell me that, of course, it's possible that it was an earlier time. A thought that crossed my mind was, is it possible that Chuck hadn't changed his clocks for daylight savings time yet, which occurred on April 1st in 1990? And one other conflict with Chuck's account was that he stated Denise was pregnant with their son at the time, but their son was actually born in April of that year. Is it possible that Chuck and Denise did witness Marky and Rhonda together, as they described, but one month earlier? We went back, and she had done had my son. You know, that was, what, tw- almost 26 years when we done the lie detector test? And, you know, I picked her up so many times at McDonald's, it was pathetic. And our son wasn't like three weeks old, you know. We we went back, me and her got to thinking, I said, well, you know, you know, we already had him. Chuck says that Denise was actually not working at McDonald's at the time of this incident because after the birth of their son, she didn't go back to work. He says that they were coming from McDonald's that night, though, because they had picked something up to eat and were headed to his mother-in-law's house. And we had went by McDonald's to get something to eat to go to her mama's, because she lived, her mama lived out there. And that's what it was when we play, replayed our memory. But we, we were sitting there talking to Marky. You know, she had already had dust, and we thought she was pregnant. God, no, that's 26 years ago. You know, but we do remember pulling up there talking to Mark. I think the other parts are relevant. You know, it don't matter. What I think Chuck means by saying, we know we saw Marky and the rest is irrelevant, is that yes, time can have a way of altering your memory a bit on smaller facts, like why they were at McDonald's. But the fact remains that they are certain they encountered Marky. I asked if he could be positive that this was the night Rhonda went missing, though. 
she went missing that night because the next day, like I told you, or I told them, I went to the fire department because Chief Anthony was the fire chief then. I went to the fire department the next day. And people, there was a bunch of people up there. And when I walked up there, and I asked, I said, what's going on? And he said, you ain't heard. I said, uh, what are you talking about? He said, Rhonda Sue Coleman went missing last night. I said, I just seen Marky and them talking to her on the dirt. And it was like, boom, everybody scattered. Regardless, Chuck and Denise almost certainly had this encounter because they both independently passed polygraphs by a veteran polygrapher. Then we've got Mitchell Wood's account. Mitchell stated he spoke to Rhonda at the Swanee Swifty that night, noting that he also saw Mickey and John there, though John hung back and didn't say much, if anything. Mickey was telling Rhonda that they had to go meet someone and made it sound as if they'd be in some kind of trouble if they were late or didn't show. He left to take a lap through town, and when he returned to the Swanee Swifty, Rhonda and the others were gone. He then describes seeing Marky's car pass by with blue lights and sirens on. He left to follow behind the deputy car, and when he ended up at the dirt road where Rhonda's car was found, he describes seeing Mickey, John, and another unidentified man in a grayish or bluish colored truck. He continued on, and when he returned a short time later, the truck was gone, but he had an encounter with Marky. Rhonda was not seen. He told me this could have been no later than 10.30 p.m. because he was home by 11. My question's here. If the deputy car was speeding by with lights and sirens on, how could he be certain it was Marky's car? And if Mitchell followed the deputy car, where was it when he drove past Rhonda's car the first time? Mitchell mentioned in my interview with him that he made a statement to a police officer named Benjamin Glosson. And as luck would have it, Benjamin Glosson was listening to the podcast and contacted me. Yeah, well, you can call me Ben. That's fine. Um, Benjamin by family, but everybody else knows me as Ben the cop. Ben told me that he does remember speaking with Mitchell Wood about three years ago. For, here's what happened from my end of it. Um, when I spoke to Mitchell, he was actually part of the contract crew that was doing work on my house. There was one day in particular where I was in and out of the house the whole time they were here. It was probably about two or three days. The one day that I talked to him, I was I was actually off duty that day, but I, I remember being in uniform because I think I had a training class or court or something going on that day that I was in. It was in uh, I was in uniform for, and uh, I come home, you know, looking at what all they had gotten done so far and. And we just struck up a conversation and he got to talking about, you know, Rhonda's case and, and all that and what happened to her. And, and uh, he said, I, I was a witness to something that I really have never told anybody. And it intrigued me, of course, you know, not only as a private citizen, but also a law enforcement officer. I said, well, what did, what did you see? And he he went into explaining, and I don't remember, let me preface by saying, I don't remember everything verbatim that he said. But I do remember him saying something about seeing Mickey Beecher at the Swanee Swifty, which is called Jacket's Corner now. He said, I, I saw him there at the Swanee Swifty with Rhonda. And, and then he said, I saw them together at the store or something like, something along those lines. I, I just remember him saying that he saw Mickey and Ron at the store at the same time. But I don't remember much else besides that because I, if he mentioned Marky at all, I don't remember. Just, just plain and simple, I really don't. When I spoke to him, it was, again, I was off duty and it was more of an informal conversation. It wasn't really like I was, you know, responded to a call said, okay, tell me what you saw, tell me this, you know, all that, you know. And I said, uh, well, have you ever told anybody what you saw? And he said, well, he said, and I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't remember if he actually said he told Milton or not. I want to say that he did. He did tell me that. But as far as him writing the statement and signing the statement form or anything like that, he did not do that. I, I will say that. For me, anyway. Ben Glosson does verify the conversation he had with Mitchell Wood. 
He lends credibility to his story, but he tells me that a formal statement was never taken by him, though he did take down some basic information from Mitchell in his notepad, like his name, date of birth, and phone number. Maybe that's where Mitchell's confusion came from, but Ben says he did tell Mitchell to make a formal report at the sheriff's department. I said, well, you know, here's what you need to do. You need to go by the sheriff's office and talk to the sheriff or one of the investigators and let them know what you saw that night. I said, fill it in and make a statement to them. I said, because this could be important to the case. And at the time, he, I don't know if he actually came right out and say it. I don't remember if he did, but he, he kind of seemed to indicate that he was kind of distrustful of people at the sheriff's office. But I just remember asking him, so why didn't you ever come forward about this? And uh, I, I don't really remember his response, but it was, it, it, you know, he, he seemed to like be hesitant and like he was just didn't, you know, he didn't know he could trust. Let's put it that way. Do you think it's important for him now to go to the sheriff's department and make that statement officially? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Because um, in my experience, any detail that you can give to law enforcement regarding a case, especially a case of this caliber, any detail is never too small, in my opinion, you know. Hearing that Mitchell had never told anyone in all these years because he seemed to not trust law enforcement in Jeff Davis County prompted me to ask Ben for his thoughts on law enforcement as a whole right now. Are there improvements that could be made? Absolutely. And that's speaking for every department in the United States. Are there things that happened or were done or said that I didn't agree with? Yes, I will say that. But Ben also tells me that all in all, he feels that the majority of police officers are the good guys they're supposed to be. I can say that with my experience working here, that the majority of the officers and the deputies that work with the sheriff's office and the police department do have the best interests of the community in their hearts. You know, you know there's, there's no doubt about that. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We talk about BetterHelp a lot on this show. And this month, we're discussing some of the stigmas around mental health. Many people think that therapy is for so-called crazy people, but therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It just means you recognize that all humans have emotions and we need to learn to control them, not avoid them. We've also been taught that mental health shouldn't be a part of normal life, but that's wrong too. We take care of our bodies with the gym, the doctor, and nutrition, and we should focus on our minds just as much. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. And Fox Hunter listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash FoxHunter. That's BetterHelp.com slash FoxHunter. How many free trial subscriptions end up costing you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, long after forgetting to cancel? Fight back against scammy subscriptions with Truebill. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel any unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped save them over $100 million. Like Jennifer B., who says, With your help, our family has saved $587 per year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash true crime. Go right now. Truebill.com slash true crime. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash true crime. Next on our eyewitness list, we have Bob and Elaine. Elaine stated that when they arrived at the Swanee Swifty, a grayish colored truck pulled in a moment later and Rhonda hopped out, going into the store. Bob and Elaine entered the store as well shortly after, as Rhonda was leaving, 
and had a brief, casual conversation. Now, I've had people ask if Bob and Elaine noticed if Rhonda seemed like she had been drinking, if she was slurring or had glassy eyes. They didn't mention this. Elaine said she seemed to be happy and in a good mood, as if everything was normal. Then, Elaine says Rhonda pulled out onto the main road and a deputy car she says was driven by Marky pulled up behind her. She said she saw Marky's face when he looked in their direction as he passed by. How did Elaine get a good look at Marky? If Rhonda had just pulled out, she would have been traveling slowly. There is a streetlight on the corner. Could that have provided enough light to see through the tinted windows? Or was there tint on only the back windows? The three cars allegedly traveled together, but Bob and Elaine say they turned off for home before reaching the dirt road. So there is no way of knowing if that deputy car tailed Rhonda the whole way to where her car was found abandoned, regardless of who was driving. Bob and Elaine both stated that the deputy car didn't have blue lights on, or even headlights, while Mitchell describes the deputy car he saw with lights and sirens. So were these the same vehicles? And none of these statements account for Brent Haynes and Tracy Deaton dropping Rhonda off at her car. Here's Tracy from our first conversation about what time she thinks it was that Rhonda was dropped off. I, it couldn't, I would say it was probably around 10, but I don't know that. So maybe 10.30. I know it was before 11 because I know Milton wouldn't have let her stay out till past that, not on a school night. But the similarities here between the accounts are that a deputy car was seen Rhonda was seen, and a grayish or light blue colored truck was seen. I'm told Mickey and John both drove similar colored trucks, with John's being a little more bluish. And this brings me back to the fox hunters, the very first witnesses I heard about. They claimed to have seen a dark colored truck drive by at a high rate of speed. But at night, in a poorly lit rural area, is it possible that the truck they witnessed was actually not a dark color. Could it have appeared darker than it really was? The truck was driving by quickly. Their eyes would have had to adjust to the headlights and then again to the taillights. Is it possible that what they saw was actually more of a silhouette than a specific dark color? Recently, I was contacted by another family member of one of those fox hunters who wanted to clear a few things up. He preferred not to take part in the podcast, but he told me that the three fox hunters were actually not hunting at all. They were doing what's called running their dogs. It's basically a practice in which they train their dogs to chase down foxes, but the fox is not always killed, if at all. There are national competitions and championships for dog running like this. Also, he wanted me to point out that these men never drank alcohol when doing this. They took it very seriously. And training the dogs like this is a skill that gets passed down through the family. This is important to note because it means that the men would have all been completely sober the night the truck raced by. So their account should be perceived as factual. One last thing he wanted me to make clear was that the men did not hear a woman cry for help. The scream they heard was just that, a scream. But it sounded to them more like teenagers messing around or goofing off. Roger Marchett and the other fox hunters, he says, would certainly have intervened if they thought a woman was in any kind of danger. And the last of the eyewitnesses we'll explore again is Rat he's the only witness that has actually stated an exact time. Rat told me that night he planned to stop by the Swanee Swifty and grab a beer and then head home when he passed by the dirt road. He notes that a deputy car was parked next to Rhonda's and he could identify it as Marky's specifically by the color of the window tint. He happened to look at the clock on his car radio just before arriving to that location and it read 10.46 p.m. When we first heard Rat's story, I told you that I was going to do everything I could to find out if he was telling me the truth. And I meant it. My name's Patrick Coffey. I'm a retired special agent with the U.S. Army Criminal Investigation Division. I was uh, 
in for 20 years, retired in 1998, opened up a private investigation business and then started doing polygraphs in 2004 and been doing them full time just for about the last 10 years exclusively. And I average about 600 tests a year. I contacted Patrick Coffey at Metro Atlanta Polygraph and explained I had a possible eyewitness to events surrounding a murder investigation. Rat made the drive to Atlanta at the end of last week, and a polygraph test was conducted to determine if he was being truthful about the account he described involving seeing Marky's deputy car next to Rhonda's. I was not allowed to be in the room when the test was administered. So I waited outside in my car until Rat walked out of the office building. Let me ask you, what what was it like taking a polygraph test? Have you, had you ever taken one before, I imagine? Uh-uh, uh-uh. What was it like taking a test like that? Were you... Hard being still, because we got a bad what? back. <laughs> Hard being still? Yeah. I then met with Mr. Coffey in his office to get a little more info on how a polygraph is actually conducted and what it really tells us. Well, it... It checks or tests physiological changes in the body, things that occur whether we want them to or not. Uh, When a person tells a lie, the brain fires a message to the body and says, you know, hey, there's a conflict here. And when that happens, it causes a physiological change in the body. And when the individuals are attached to the instruments of the polygraph, we, can, we do what's called a, a continuous monitoring of the homeostasis of the body. So I can see what's going on in the body the whole time they're attached to the instruments. And it's the timing of those physiological changes in the body in correlation with the questions that indicate whether or not a person's being truthful or not. So that's basically how the polygraph works. We, we, we just measure physiological responses. We just say that there's a significant response uh, which indicates deception or there's no significant response uh, which there's no deception indicated. Mr. Coffey then reads me the results of Rat's test. Okay, the questions, the relevant questions that I ask him, are you sure the car you saw that night parked next to the Coleman girl's car was Marky's? He answered yes and there was no deception indicated. I asked him, are you being truthful about the accounts of that night? He answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. Are you sure about the time being 1046 at the time you saw the cars there? He said yes, and there was no deception indicated. Uh, Are you sure the other car you saw that night was Rhonda Coleman's car? And he answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. I asked if in Mr. Coffey's professional and expert opinion, he believed Rat was being truthful about his eyewitness account. Yes, I, I believe he is being truthful, yes. Several days later, Mitchell Wood made the same trip to Mr. Coffey's office and was polygraphed on the account he gave me. And here's Mr. Coffey again, this time with Mitchell's results. The questions that I asked him, the relevant questions, did you see Rhonda with Mickey Beecher the night she went missing? He answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. Did you see Marky Hall in the road next to Rhonda's car the night she went missing? He answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. Did Marky tell you that night If you didn't want something bad to happen to you, you better leave now. He answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. Did you hear Mickey Beecher tell Rhonda they had to go meet someone, and she knows what would happen if they did not show? He answered yes, and there was no deception indicated. You've been doing this a long time. Yep. In your opinion, and just talking to him, in addition to the test results, but I mean, is this guy telling us the truth? I believe so, yeah. he uh, He's very straightforward, no no doubt in my mind that he's, he's being truthful. Geico asks, 
How would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves, and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. We now have four individuals that have passed polygraphs administered by two different people stating that they witnessed either Marky or one of his vehicles at the scene of Rhonda's abduction. Though Rat did not physically see Marky himself at the scene and has not once accused him of Rhonda's murder, nor has Mitchell. Patrick Coffey had not heard of Rhonda Coleman before I contacted him and has not heard any of this podcast. So I have to believe that these were fair, accurate, and unbiased results. Not to mention that Patrick is a licensed professional, bound by laws and codes of ethics. So what now? Our timeline isn't complete yet, but it's coming together. I'm still getting little pieces of information daily about numerous persons of interest. And while lately, it seems that Marky's name has been mentioned more than any other, let's not forget about why the other names we've heard are still people of interest. Like John, for one. He knew the remote area where Rhonda's body was found, and he had just cleared timber from the area weeks before. He had an altercation with Rhonda on at least one occasion, shortly before her death, and multiple of my sources told me that he had a hostile temperament towards women he dated. Remember the story about allegedly holding a pair of scissors to a woman's neck and threatening to kill her. He had a gas can in his truck that would have contained fuel consistent of that which would be used for a chainsaw, a mixture of gas and oil, which could potentially match the type of fuel used to partially burn Rhonda's body. And there were tire tracks that matched what was on his truck found at both locations. I've also recently been contacted by a person claiming that John's mother was certainly lying for him when she said he was home asleep when Rhonda went missing. The woman tells me that at around 9.30 that night, John had actually stopped her across from Fales Furniture Store and asked if she had a joint. Like I did with Marky, I have questions and I want to talk to John. I've tried to contact him repeatedly now for months with no response. I decided it was time to try him again to get it all out on the table. I'm sorry, the person you are trying to reach has a voicemail box that has not been set up yet. Please try your call again later. Goodbye. Again, no response from John. And I still haven't heard back from Treese, the woman who was dating John at the time of Rhonda's disappearance. She may have valuable information, whether she realizes it or not. If you're listening now, Treese, I'd love to talk to you. I still haven't been able to reach Greg either. Are these men listening? I wonder. 
Are they avoiding me? And if so, why? Do they not want the opportunity to tell their story, to defend themselves against the accusations made about them in this community for decades? If you're listening, John, Greg, I'd like to speak to both of you. And who was that other person in the truck Mitchell saw? This person has not been identified yet. So who was he? As I sit here writing this episode, I can't help but be hopeful. I don't yet have all the answers that I, the Colemans, and the community at large have been looking for, but I feel like we're getting somewhere. With all the support from the community of Hazelhurst and beyond, and conversations now being had about Rhonda's case, I feel like we are at the precipice of a breakthrough. I don't think at any time since Rhonda's death have so many people become involved in talking about the case. Milton and I discussed this briefly. I, I think it's uh, very good. I, I think it's great. It's, it's got people stirred up. It's got them talking. And that's what it's going to take to solve this thing is people realizing they ain't got to be afraid no more. They can do it. And you ain't got to worry about the laws. It's in the, the, past, the past law is gone. You don't have to worry about them. You can you can feel free to talk and, and, and talk publicly or whatever, and uh, do an outstanding job. You know, get out and uh, you remembering things. This broadcast has got you remembering things, and I think it's great. People from all over the world, in countries like Japan, Egypt, Spain, and Australia, now know the name Rhonda Sue Coleman. They join the community of Hazelhurst in raising their hands up high and saying, we want answers. And now is the time. Until we get the truth, we will not stop. At the release of this episode, I'll be personally making a $500 donation to the Rhonda Coleman Reward Fund. I ask that you, the listener, please consider donating if you can. If each person listening pledges just one dollar, we can make a huge impact. If not, by someone claiming the reward due to information they've provided resulting in an arrest and conviction, then for the charitable organizations the Colemans will donate the money to. You can find out more and donate at foxhunterpodcast.com. This story, I think, has become about much more than just Rhonda Sue Coleman. It's become an eye-opener for all of the people who were unaware of the vast corruption involving some of their most trusted elected officials. People sworn to uphold the law and protect them. Rhonda's is one of more than a dozen unsolved murders in the surrounding area over the years, and she has now become the poster child for the fight for answers and a shining beacon of light to guide our way to the truth. We want justice for Rhonda, but it doesn't stop there. As a community, the people of Hazelhurst deserve better. You deserve to not fear or distrust law enforcement in your town, as I've heard from so many. And while I certainly won't stand here and tell you that everyone in law enforcement has been corrupted, I don't believe that to be true at all. You can't let a few bad apples spoil the whole bunch. The honest, Hardworking members of your law enforcement community must be your allies, and they need your support as much as you need theirs. After all, the community belongs to all of you. But there's one more thing that's been bothering me. Something Roy Robertson said when I spoke to him months ago hasn't left my mind over the past few weeks. So I paid him another visit, and we sat down for a very serious discussion one-on-one about what he claims to know. And what he told me, if true, well, you just have to hear it for yourself. So you you said that Mark Hall told you one of the times he came and he he had been drinking and he was upset... And he had told you something about his son. 
Yeah, and, and about Marky and, and Marky's involvement. Can you tell me that from what you remember that in detail? Well, I just I just remember you know him telling me that uh, uh, he had reached a point that he knew Marky was involved in. You know. It was eating Mark alive, but said, that's when he said he had reached a point that he knew he had to arrest his son. Oh, and one more thing, this is not the end, not by a long shot. I have much more to share here, and I'm just getting started. More episodes are on their way. The tip line is going to stay open. The reward money is still out there. And you won't believe what's coming. Fox Hunter is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was created, written, and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote the original music score. Executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Story editor is Jason Hoke. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Key cover art provided by Joe Freeman Jr. Keychalis 9032, 2015. Joe Fox Hunter is a 10 episode series available every Tuesday morning. Follow us on social media at Fox Hunter Podcast. If you like the show, leave us a review and tell your friends. Thanks for listening. Rhonda Sue Coleman's murder case is still open. Any information that you or someone you know might have about the abduction or murder of Rhonda Coleman could be critical to solving this case. You can call our anonymous tip line at 470-440-1150, email us at foxhunterpodcast at gmail.com, or reach out directly to the GBI at 1-800-597-TIPS. All of this information, as well as how to donate to the Rhonda Coleman Reward Fund, is available at foxhunterpodcast.com.